yesterday. <laughs> hey, Jude, I want to hold your hand. We all live in a yellow submarine. Back in the USSR, lovely Rita Meter Maid. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Strawberry Fields Forever. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Sound pretty familiar, right? In spite of the fact that the Decca Recording Company told these Englishmen in 1964, quote, Groups with guitars are on their way out. <laughs> John, Paul, George, and Ringo went on to change a generation or three. They are called the Fab Four. Add one more song, though, to the best of the Beatles, and what would that be? Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun was composed by... George Harrison, and it appeared in 1969 for the first time. On what Beatles album? Anybody know? Joel Esslinger, surely you know. You know all kinds of things. <laughs> well, here you go. Abbey Road. Here comes the sun. That's a good way to organize our thoughts around today's Old Testament reading in Malachi chapters 3 and 4. Here comes the sun, right? The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Malachi, from the Old Testament side, understands S-U-N, son of righteousness. From the New Testament side, looking back on Malachi, we know exactly that he's talking about S-O-N, as in Jesus, God the Son and the Son of God. Here comes the Son. That's the theme of this short little four-chapter book called Malachi. So why look at Malachi today? Because this weekend, many of you know, is the last weekend of the church year. Next weekend, we begin a new church year. We call that Advent Week 1. But before we get to Advent Week 1, we come to the end, the end of the church year, which is often called Christ the King Sunday, right? Christ the King Sunday. The focus not so much on the crown of thorns, <laughs> but on the crown of gold. Christ's second coming, right? At the cry of an archangel, the trumpet call of God, the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which shall have no end. The Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven to separate the sheep from the goats, believers from unbelievers. That's what Malachi chapters 3 and 4 are all about. Malachi, long before George Harrison came along, said what? Here comes the sun. But the people in Malachi's day, Malachi writing about 450 B.C., these people had a hard time believing this. <laughs> and so do we. Let's take a look. The frustration of these people in Malachi's day, right? Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. The frustration of these people is evident throughout all four chapters. Why, already in the first chapter, verse 7, these people are saying the Lord's table is contemptible. Now imagine that, coming to church and saying, where God gives his gifts to his people, his table, that's not glorious, that's not beautiful, that's not awe-inspiring. They're saying, this is contemptible. Why would they say that? Because they're frustrated. They're frustrated over the apparent slowness of God to act on their behalf. And then in... <laughs> Verse 13 of Malachi 1, they think about coming to worship, right? 
publicly celebrate the goodness of their God and what is on their minds and in their hearts. What a burden, right? What a hassle, especially 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, on a Thanksgiving weekend. Can't we just skip this once? What a burden, they say. They're so frustrated. And then they come along in chapter 2. Where is the God of justice? Can you see the frustration? Can you relate with that frustration? Where is the God of justice? God, you said the sun would come and you would right every wrong. You would heal every hurt. You would vindicate your people. You would gain the final victory. God, where are you? The horror of human history just continues to unfold unrelentlessly. Just this past week, right? Over 300 people at a mosque in the North Sinai region of Egypt leaving worship were horrifically gunned down and murdered. And this is just the latest. We could go to Texas. We could go to Las Vegas. Uh, we could go to a, a Lutheran church in Chester, Virginia, who just this past week had a member, an LCMS church, had a member kill three family members. Where is the God of justice? It seems as though so often God's promises are null and void. Well, the frustration is very evident. Finally, we get to chapter 3, and these people say it's vain to serve God. It's useless. My prayers, my worship, my devotion, my following, my Bible reading, it's just vain. Vain means empty, worthless, uh, without a fact. It's trying to nail jello to a wall. Anybody ever try that? It doesn't work. Serving God doesn't work. It's a waste of my time. And then they say this. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. The swamp will never be drained, <laughs> right? The evildoers, all the corrupt politicians and business people, they're prospering. They test God and God will never judge them. Can you hear the cynicism and sarcasm in all of this? The, the, the jaded worldview, the hard heart, oh, we all know about this, right? It's so easy to look at life and history and events and become jaded, cynical, sarcastic, hard-hearted, walk around with a chip on our shoulder, and our prayers, they don't deepen. Our devotion doesn't grow. Our generosity stagnates. The frustration in Malachi's day and in our day, even among the believers, is evident. This is a 1964 Chevy Impala. My dad and mom owned a 1964 Chevy Impala, much like this one. And, and one day in 1964, being five years old, I watched my dad fill up our Chevy Impala with gas. And wanting to be so much like my dad, I decided to do the same thing a few days later. So I took a hose and I put it in the gas opening in the Chevy Impala. Did I tell you it was a garden hose that I put in to that car? And just as I was ready to turn on the water, my horrified father came rushing in and foiled my plan. Now some of you are thinking just now, Reed Lessing has always been crazy. There's the proof. I prefer 
to say it was a misconception. (laughs) It was a misconception over what kind of hose it takes to fill a car up with gas. Misconceptions can be humorous. Misconceptions can be harmful. Some misconceptions can be horrific. It is a horrific misconception to believe that Jesus won't come back for his church. To believe that there will be no cry of the archangel, no final trumpet call of God. It is a horrific misconception to believe that there is no final victory for the church. Because then we lose all hope. Uh, then th- there's no rhyme or reason to life. Then there's no final resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. But you see, <laughs> the sun is coming. You can count on it. Why is that? If the frustration is evident in Malachi's day and in our day, the sun will come. <laughs> he most certainly will come. And the foundation of that is love. Love. If you really love someone, you want to be united with that person. You want to spend eternity with that person. And that's the foundation for Christ's second coming. Love. Love. What kind of love? Malachi tells us. Malachi 3.17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies is what that means. Heavenly armies. In that day. What day? The final day. Right? The day when the sun comes. On that day, God said, I will act for my treasured possession. The Hebrew there in Malachi's Hebrew is transliterated up on the screens Segula. Segula. It appears only eight times in the Old Testament, and it's God's most endearing term for his people. Segula, segula, prize, priceless possession. You are invaluable. Uh, The idea comes just twice in the New Testament. Titus 2.14. 1 Peter 2.9 is a famous verse, right? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That phrase, belonging to God, <laughs> that's segula. A segula isn't loved because it's valuable. This is huge. A segula is not love because it's valuable. It's valuable because it's loved. Case in point, my high school letter jacket. Here it is, Jefferson High School, 1977. I only had two letters. I went out for football for three years. I never lettered in football. Go figure. (laughs) But I lettered in baseball. This is my segula. It's not love because it's valuable. My wife says, lose it, man. But it's valuable because it's loved. That's the idea. Treasured possession. See, Israel in the Old Testament was never loved because they were valuable. You know something about the Old Testament, right? The whole thing really gets started in Genesis 11.30, where Sarai, later called Sarah in Genesis chapter 17, Sarai is barren. She can't have children. And you know what they said back in the day in the ancient Near East? They would say, Sarai is worthless. And that's just getting started. (laughs) They are worthless then, this nation that comes out of Sarah and Abraham. They're worthless because they're state slaves in the book of Exodus. Deuteronomy 7.7 says they are the least of all the people. See, in the eyes of the nations, Israel was worthless. State slaves, least among the nations. Deuteronomy 26 verse 5 calls them perishing Arameans. You will not hear of a NFL team call themselves perishing Arameans. It just doesn't really make sense. In the eyes of the nations, the Israelites 
were worthless. Perishing Arameans. You ever feel worthless? Uh, maybe someone has told you, looked at you straight in the eye and say, you are worthless. You will never amount to anything. Or maybe that's your self-talk. I'm worthless. I'll never amount to anything. But in God's eyes, <laughs> you're a segula, right? A prized, priceless possession. We are not loved because we're valuable. <laughs> we're POH, plain old humans, right? We're not loved because we're valuable, folks. We're messed up people. But we're valuable because we're loved. And because of that love, <laughs> most certainly the Son will come. If the frustration is evident, where is the God of justice, right? The foundation for the second coming of the Son of Man is this kind of radical love. Which means what? The future? <laughs> the future is glorious. Glorious. Beyond description, really. Bad Joke alert. Here it comes. I, I told you beforehand, all right? Bad joke alert. Sherlock Holmes, so I'm told, died and was welcomed into heaven. You know Sherlock Holmes, that great detective. All the angels and archangels, all the company of heaven worshipped the lamb sitting on the throne. But they turned to welcome Sherlock Holmes. After a few days, one of the angels came to Sherlock and said, Sherlock, we have a mystery here. We have lost Adam and Eve. Sherlock told the angel, elementary, my dear angel, I'll find them promptly. After a few days, Sherlock Holmes came to the angel and said, I found Adam and Eve. Well, where are they, the angel said. Hey, Sherlock said, they're right over there, stand by the gate. How do you know they're Adam and Eve? Here it comes, brace yourself. Elementary, <laughs> Sherlock said. They're the only ones without belly buttons. Oh, no. <laughs> we don't know all of the details of the new heaven and new earth. How old will I be? Will I recognize the people that I love? What will the landscape look like? We don't know all of the details of heaven, but we do know that that future for the baptized, that future is glorious. That's what Malachi says. Chapter 4, verse 2. But for you who fear my name, God is speaking through the prophet, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go forth leaping like calves, released from the stall. This glorious future can be summarized in three words that I've highlighted up there for us. Son, healing, and calves. Let's take each of those words in turn. Son. Son. It means all the darkness is dead. All the gloom is gone. All of the nightmares of horror and shame are forever banished. You see, the sun will come, <laughs> and the sun defeats the darkness. And he's not any old sun. He's the sun of righteousness. You get that, right? We're not righteous in and of ourselves, but this sun declares us Righteous, by grace, through faith, our righteous standing, forgiven and washed in the blood of Jesus, that righteous standing will be evident for all to see on that day in all the beauty and brilliance of the sun. Malachi then goes on to say, 
this son of righteousness will arise with healing. Healing. God will put Humpty Dumpty back together again. God will restore everything that is broken. On this day when the son of righteousness comes, all of the pain of our life will be erased. Every tear we've cried will be wiped from our face. Every bitter pill, you you swallowed bitter pills? Oh, we all have. Every bitter pill we have ever swallowed will be forever forgotten. And all the sunsets we miss and all the symphonies we didn't see will be played over and over again. There will be healing restoration for people broken by divorce, healing restoration for people broken by sexual abuse, healing restoration by people broken by a spouse, a child, a parent, healing restoration for people broken by the darkness called death. In the twinkling of an eye, (laughs) At the final trumpet sound, the son of righteousness shall rise, and he will have healing, perfect healing in his wings. And on that day, we will finally see face to face the crown of thorns that were on his head. We will see face to face the marks where the nails went into his hands and feet. On that day with perfect 2020 vision, we'll see the bat that was scourged and we will see the side that was pierced with a Roman spear and we will hear these words with perfect hearing. Enter into the joy of your master. All of this is God's gift for you. <laughs> And so much more, because you know that there was once, a once and for all time, a total eclipse of this sun we're talking about. Oh, oh my, you know this, don't you? For three hours over the whole face of the earth, there was a total eclipse of the sun. We're talking S O. Ed. We're talking Good Friday. We're talking the afternoon of Good Friday. And it was dark. His friends had left him. His countrymen were clamoring for his death. And his mother standing at the foot of the cross, Mary is living her worst nightmare. Jesus is in the middle gasping for air. And it is so dark. It is the total eclipse of the sun. One of my favorite Easter hymns, maybe it's yours as well, is in Lutheran service book 469. Stanza 2. Love's redeeming work is done. Fought the fight, the battle won. Lo, our sun. Eclipse is o'er. You with me on this? Lo, our son's eclipse is o'er. Lo, he sets in blood no more. (laughs) He's alive. (laughs) He's very much alive. And that means he will come with healing in his wings. But there's more. There is always more in the gospel of Jesus. Remember the third word in Malachi 4, verse 2, calves. Calves on that day, the final day, they will go forth and leap like calves released from the stall. Now, think about that. When you're in a stall and you're a calf, there are boundaries and limitations. You're stuck, you're trapped. You and I have boundaries and limitations. Our aging bodies. We're limited in space and time. We're limited 
We have 60, 70, maybe 80 years. We have so many limits and boundaries placed upon us. But the day is coming, right? Malachi said it. I believe it. When we will go forth like calves released from the stall. Can you imagine that? No more limitations. No more boundaries. This is freedom. This is being fully alive. Critics deny it. Cynics laugh at it. The brightest and best think that the second coming of Jesus is a myth, a fable, a legend. But it stands, (laughs) firm as a rock, soon to be revealed, when all the faithful will Celebrate with great joy. Here comes the sun. And then what will we say? Oh, you know what we'll say. (laughs) We'll say this. (laughs) Sun, sun, sun. Here he comes. I invite you to stand and practice for that day.